2015 has come and gone, but those faithful memories won't be left behind in the dust. As you may have possibly noticed, this year has been a busy one for me. I mean, you can count the number of videos I released this year on one hand. One of them was not even intentionally fit for entertainment purposes. Nevertheless, I just wanted to give you one last hoorah and a huge thank you for staying dedicated to this channel. I'm actually surprised. Even when I wasn't releasing content, I still kept getting subscriptions. Maybe I should take the next year off. It sure saves me the break. But seriously, it's been wonderful doing videos for the past 10 years, and I am excited to share more. Thank you, and enjoy the countdown. At number 10 on this list marks Jurassic World. I, like many of you out there, loved the first Jurassic Park as a kid. As a matter of fact, it was one of my favorite movies and the sole reason I initially wanted to be a paleontologist. But what can I say about Jurassic World and why does it make number 10 on my list? Well, when I first heard there was going to be another Jurassic Park movie, I was partly excited but my child-bearing love for dinosaurs somewhat faded over the years. Even more interesting is that Jurassic World takes notice of the general population's declining interest in dinosaurs, and therein lies the premise for the movie's act too. To be fair, this movie was a lot of fun, and without spoiling the ending, the final action scene had me growing a gradual smile until I couldn't feel my cheeks. To say the least, this movie was awesome and reminded me of my nostalgic love for dinosaurs. Cinderella I watched this because the trailer looked charming, unlike a whole slew of Disney films nowadays. The movie was surprisingly witty and funny. The sense of humor and overall feel of Cinderella felt timeless. I mean, maybe that's what made this stand out from Jurassic World. Nowadays, I get a sense that a lot of movies, especially rehashes, remakes, reboots, or whatever you want to call them, feel like they are trying too hard to keep up with popular mainstream culture. Perhaps it has something to do with the fact that these big name companies are marketing overseas to other countries, and so everything has to be broader for those countries to understand. And poor America is trapped in the dichotomous middle where even our audiences are slowly diverging into the lack of rich culture found in films nowadays. Oddly, even though I find Disney being one of the biggest gluttons for overseas sales, this 2015 version of Cinderella felt like a breath of fresh air, far away from all that. Speaking of timeless breaths of fresh air, at number 8, my heart goes out to one of the most charming movies I've seen in a while. The Peanuts movie just puts a smile on my face. It wasn't at all trying to be hip or rad or anything. I mean, everyone's dance moves hasn't even changed in the past 50 years. If that's not saying something, I don't know what is. Every time I think about this movie, I can't help but aww. Blue Sky did an amazing job making it feel like a true Charles Scholes adaptation. But without saying anything that hasn't already been said, I'll just finish my review for the Peanuts movie with this. There is hope for future animated features. As much as I love the Peanuts movie, I was very surprised to see this movie become a feature of its own. Paddington felt like one of those classic children's movies I watched growing up, like Matilda, Three Ninjas, or Hocus Pocus, I, I guess. It's one of those movies you don't remember watching as a kid, but will probably never get back to seeing. It will only remain but a fond memory. And that's the vibe I get from Paddington for this generation of children. Although I'd like to be wrong, it just seems like this movie was so soft-spoken and lighthearted to match with your Frozens and Kung Fu Pandas. But that's what made this movie such a big standout for me this year. Paddington's lighthearted nature was a fuzzy delight, and I also found myself laughing out loud in theaters constantly throughout the showing. Luckily, I was the only one in that auditorium. At number 6 is the only foreign feature to make this list, Guk Je Shi Chang, or O To My Father as the English title suggests. I actually wanted to do a separate review for this movie when I first saw it back in February, but as you can tell, I didn't. I'll give you a quick premise. So we follow the life of the main character, Duk Su, who lost his father and younger sister in a tragic accident during the Hungnam evacuation during the Korean War back in the 50s. Young Duk Su, being a North Korean, doesn't fit in too well as he refuges to South Korea, but his main motivation has always been to be the man of the house in place of his father, whom he has high hopes of reuniting with someday. 
Duke Sue's adventures are very genuine and rather humorous at times, considering his characteristics to stand out and impress his consociates, even though they are almost always out of his league. This is a slight spoiler for those who haven't seen it, but I feel I have to say this. He does reunite with his long-lost sister, who has been in America all this time thanks to major broadcasting stations, alleging Koreans to reunite with possible relatives who have been lost all this time. Bear in mind, this is 30 years later, so the chances of making a direct match were scarce. Why do I bring this up? Because I happen to watch this movie with my pastor and his wife, his wife who lost her family in the same war. If the feels in the movie weren't heavy enough, imagine sitting next to someone who went through the same thing. I couldn't even budge my head because I didn't want to know if the pastor's wife was crying or not. And to make matters extra heavy, we watched the movie back to back. Again. Well, that's because we missed the beginning and the pastor wanted to see what we missed. I honestly thought we were going to leave after we've caught up to the part we came in at, but no, we sat through those dramatic scenes all over again. Don't get me wrong, this movie was well done for a Korean film and definitely stood out as one of my unique movie going experiences this year. But oh man, put me in a situation like that again and I'm going to have to forewarn my anxiety. Phew. Seriously though, great movie. For those who know me, I love all forms of animation, but stop motion is such a treat to see and I don't think I have to explain why. When I first saw the trailers for Shaun the Sheep, I had high hopes and was getting worried the more and more I watched it because I thought the movie wouldn't hold its weight. But Shaun the Sheep definitely pulled through. This movie was so amazingly clever, and with the absence of any verbal dialogue, this movie deserves extra points for being as hilarious as it was clear. I'm serious, not one person spoke, yet you get what's going on. I saw this with my nephew, who was two at the time, and I was laughing harder than he. It's quite simple. Shaun the Sheep was a terrific, well done, wonderfully imaginative film, which I hope more people get a chance to see. And I think I take back what I said earlier. This movie was foreign. It was made by Brits. At number four on my list is Woodlawn. Woodlawn surprised me. I am not a fan of sports movies. Woodlawn was a huge exception, and I hate to use that word because Woodlawn was simply one of the best Christian drama and sports dramas I have seen. It was fantastically directed, the action scenes when the play was on felt like a well choreographed action movie, the soundtrack that especially played during these scenes were exhilaratingly creative. I'd say if I had to, I would put it on par with the Dark Knight action scenes even though The Dark Knight is obviously not a sports movie. I can say action, can I? There is action in football. But even more so than the action itself, the movie holds its own as a wonderfully told historical piece. I didn't think the movie came off as preachy, but when I say preachy, I mean the movie is deliberately telling the audience how to live their life and by what moral standards are right and wrong. That's where Woodlawn succeeds. It has its Christian moments, but it doesn't at all feel like it's deliberately telling the audience this is how you need to live your life. Although, if you were just as touched by those scenes as I was, you'd definitely be encouraged. Down to the last three, and at number three is another sports drama. This time, heading over to the boxing ring. Creed was a phenomenal piece of art. This is my first time going to see a movie with Michael B. Jordan, and I just have to say, this kid is going places. Creed definitely felt like a Rocky movie, but it also felt like its own thing too. I believe a reboot, refranchisement, or whatever you call it is strong if it has its own weight elements to it, and doesn't need to pull on the reins of its successors to survive. There's not much I have to say for Creed either. It was simply a heartfelt boxing drama where character was the biggest core of this movie. If you haven't seen Creed yet, see it as well as the other movies on this list. But before I finish, I want to make two comments. The cinematography was impressive. I mean, that boxing match where it felt like it was one entire shot with no takes? Wow! And I got extreme feels when Creed went down momentarily in the last fight. I won't spoil it, but the memory that shocks him back into Wake? Just... I don't understand it. Just... This had to have made the list. You saw it coming, you know you did. And if you haven't seen the movie yet, you're missing out. From beginning to end, this movie kicks you in the butt so hard, 
I'm out of breath just thinking about it. Honestly, they don't make them like they used to is now an understatement. People could learn from George Miller. What can I say that hasn't already been said? This year, my top movie for 2015 was No Escape. I knew I would enjoy it at the simplicity of it being an action drama type movie with Owen Wilson, but I had no idea this movie would kick me into high gear, holding onto the edge of my seat as much as I was in Mad Max. Act 2 happened so quickly, I wasn't prepared for it, not prepared at all. Not even a full day after settling in does Owen Wilson find himself in the middle of a rampaging coup. From there, the story explains itself. Owen has to get his family the heck out of there. Looking back, it's a little ridiculous seeing Owen Wilson escape some of his predicaments, but when you're really into it, you don't care. You believe every bit of it. You don't question it because you're so in awe that what's happening is happening and it's happening so suddenly. This movie had me thinking, what if I had a family of my own? Would my family and I react the way the characters in this movie did? Possibly. My potential daughter may possibly resist risky escape ploys because she's too scared to think sensibly. I, I guess. And, and that's what I loved about No Escape. The characters felt so rich in their what the hell do I do moments, and there's no time to actually think through their situation. On top of that, since every move is a risk, this movie felt like one big intense chess match that I couldn't help wanting to keep going even though it hurt to watch. It was a close match. But because of the realistic scenarios that got me thinking about my own future and the possible event of a coup rebellion, and because the heart of the characters relied on the risks they were willing to take, No Escape makes my number one movie for 2015. I'm sure I can say tons more about this movie, but give it a watch for yourself. My words are only conjectural comments at the end of the day.